<coughs> scripture reading today comes from John 17. Um, this is a section in John. If you uh, are, are really involved with scripture, the, the high priestly prayer of Jesus um, from the, the last section of John before we get to the end of things for his life. And we're in chapter 17. And we must uh, remember that if, if you know your, your Gospels very well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are much different than John. In John, uh, there isn't anybody asking Jesus to teach us to pray where we learn the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven. Um, this is the Lord's Prayer that we're going to see right here as far as John is concerned, okay? This starts at verse 1 going through 11. Chapter 17, and the passage goes like this. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word, now they know everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, would you pray with me? Almighty God, I pray that the words of my lips and the thoughts of my heart will be pleasing and acceptable to you at this time. Amen. All right. That we may be one as they are one. Well, that's pretty powerful language right there. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus, whom you've sent. That's eternal life for the, for, the, for the words of Jesus himself from John. Eternal life to know God and to know Christ. Now, we're not talking about knowing about them. We're talking about knowing them intimately, as if you would know a spouse or know your brother or know your mom. Knowing God. Knowing Christ. We see the word glory here thrown around a lot in this chapter and uh, in the Bible in general. And glory, um, in human terms, glory means to the, something you've achieved. So I think, okay, my, one of my favorites, Larry Bird, right? We want to give that guy glory because of what he did. Um, it's, it's renowned. It's something we, we have for athletes or movie stars, whatever, actors. The Greek word is doxa, where we get the word doxology, okay, means glory. But when the Bible gets it, the New Testament especially gets it, it's a translation of a Hebrew word that means heavy or weighty, but it's, it's given more than that when it applies to God. And that means um, honor awe, love, and so much more. But since God is fundamentally invisible for us, 
the glory of God is the way that He is manifest on earth through you. The way that we help bring about God on earth. How we help see people see God on earth. That's a pretty big deal. So the psalmist says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare your glory, right? Solomon's temple was filled with God's glory. God's actions reveal his glory. And nowhere else will we see in the Bible more about God's actions than we see in Jesus himself. And Jesus' character and who he is and what he does and how he acts and what he does with people is evidence about what this all means. And what that really boils down to, that glory, is involved with grace. Many years ago, um, and, I, and I read this in a book that I'll tell you about in a minute, but many years ago I read about an organization in Los Angeles that started up a, a, a phone line. And its phone line was called the Apology Sounding Off Line. And it was a telephone service where people could call in and confess things that they had done, apologize. For the price of a phone call, people could call this line and say whatever it was they did and ask for forgiveness or tell them I'm sorry. Nearly 200 callers per day called this number to apologize from, from anything from really heavy-duty crimes to things about how they treated their loved ones. One person apologized for all the damage she did while she was an addict, all the pain and suffering she created in her family while she was an addict. Another one cried on the line, pouring her, per, her heart out apologizing for a car accident that she caused. They were looking for glory and grace. But it was left in the hands of an answering machine in a 60-second phone call. The people no longer trusted their priest or their pastor or any other source for that matter to go to to say, I'm sorry. Someone once said they walked in to, uh, you re- do you remember W.C. Fields? Um, some of the younger people might not remember W.C. Fields. Um, <clears throat> W.C. Fields uh, was a little black and white movie star and a well-known agnostic, if you didn't know that. And um, somebody walked into his dressing room one time and caught him reading a Bible. And W.C. Field was embarrassed, slammed the Bible shut. Thinking quick on his feet, he said, I'm looking for loopholes in the Bible. But the person who wrote about this story said it was much more likely that he was looking for grace, looking for mercy, looking for hope. It might be a lot easier to see the glory of humans But it's very sad that so many of us miss seeing the glory of God. (coughs) To glorify God each day, to see Him each day. If you know me very well, you'll you'll start to know that um, I'm not a big fan of religion. Because religion really isn't Christianity sometimes. Religion wants to make God the boss and you the employees, you know? So religion might treat the whole thing as a contract. Um, and contracts have conditions. So in many cases, you do the right things and you're going to be fine. You do the wrong things and you might have to get another job. But there's no intimacy in that relationship. No dialogue. Just do your part and you'll get rewarded. Go to heaven. Right? But there's no intimacy there. We are called to reveal God's glory. 
my uh, preaching professor, not not preaching, uh, New Testament professor at SMU was uh, a Yale girl um, who was an expert on the Gospel of John. And I had her for the Gospel of John, Jamie Clark Souls. And she wrote about this passage. And she said, is it any wonder that the four great examples of discipleship in John come from the Samaritan woman, the man born blind, Mary, the 12-year-old unmarried girl, and doubting Thomas? Is it any wonder? And what is it that they all have in common? They all had a relationship and an encounter with the living Christ. They knew who he was. They found out who he was. And that leads them to worship. And it leads them to run into the world and tell other people. Come and see this man, said the Samaritan woman, who knows everything about me. What does that mean to you? me what does this prayer from john mean to you and to me what do we do with it we're meant to overhear this prayer right it's a prayer for you this is jesus praying to god for you and for me well um i've been talking about this guy a lot lately because he's been on my mind but philip yancey wrote a book called what's so amazing about grace you should read it it's an excellent book and at the very end of that book, and maybe the very last story, he tells a story that happened in June of 1988. And there was a big rock marathon concert happening at Wembley Stadium in London, right? They were celebrating the changes that had happened to, with apartheid, you know, and all the slavery and things that happened in South, A South Africa, um, and the changes that happened with Nelson Mandela. So this 12-hour marathon rock concert, the Bee Gees were there, um, Sting was there, Dire Straits was there. Dire Straits, you know, very good. <laughs> okay. Um, Guns N' Roses were there. Stevie Wonder was there. All kinds of people were there. And if you can imagine a 12-hour concert now, rock and rollers, the crowd was out there getting a little bit more inebriated, a little more high, a little more rowdy as the day went on, a little bit more wild. Stevie Wonder's uh, show was delayed three hours because the crowd stole some of his equipment <laughs> and he couldn't go out um, for quite a while. Well, what was happening, and most people didn't know, is that during this concert, Bill Moyers, remember Bill Moyers? Bill Moyers was doing an interview with a lady named um, uh, Jesse Norman, an African-American lady, an opera singer, okay? I had never heard of her. But Jesse Norman was doing an interview with Bill Moyers about the song Amazing Grace, its origins, where it came from, how it happened, what the guy who wrote it was about, what he did with his life, and all of that. So they would interview with her, and then flash to the unruly crowd and then come back to her talking about Amazing Grace, go back to the unruly crowd and back and forth, right? Jesse Norman talking about Amazing Grace. Um, what nobody in the crowd knew was that the organizers of this event had planned for Jesse to be the closing act, to sing that hymn that they were talking about. And she was going to sing it a cappella. Nobody out there with her. So then the last band left the stage. And all the lights went out except for one single spotlight on the stage. And Jesse Norman walked out into that spotlight. And the crowd started to stir. And it wasn't in a good way. Somebody yelled out for more Guns N' Roses. 
And then a whole bunch of the other people in the crowd took up the chant for more Guns N' Roses while this lady's standing on the stage. The scene was getting pretty ugly. And then Jesse, with no backup band, no backup vocals, started to sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And then the most remarkable thing happened at Wembley Stadium on that night, June 1988. This wild and rowdy crowd full of trouble went silent in the face of grace. By the second verse, Jesse Norman had them in her hands and they were mesmerized. By the third verse, there were trickles of sing along as these kids started to remember the words of this hymn they'd heard somewhere back in the past. And later on in an interview, Jesse Norman confessed that she didn't really understand what power had descended upon Wembley Stadium that night. But many who heard this story, including Philip Yancey, immediately knew what power had descended upon Wembley Stadium that night. Because this world thirsts for grace. And when grace descends, the world falls down silent before it. And Jesus wants us to be one with God, one with him. This is eternal life. And we are the ones who show this grace. Jesus makes God the father of all of us, makes us heirs to all that is his meaning that we become the most favored, specially chosen, precious children of God. And we receive this wondrous, amazing, awe-inspiring gift because God loves us. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a God that I want to serve, that I want to show the world that I want the world to see. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, help us to be your glory in this world. Help us to show this grace to people around us in every way we can. Because when your grace shows up, it changes lives, it changes hearts, it changes people. It changes us. Help us, O oh Lord, to so be this church that you've called us to be, that we can be a partner in introducing your grace to this dark and hurting world. I ask this for all of us, in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From where I sit, this is an amazing calling. It's an amazing gift. It's the opportunity to see God face to face in this world. It's an opportunity to show someone this grace, this love that's been given to us. It's a spectacular thing. And my invitation to you is to not only remember these words from Jesus himself, that this is eternal life. To know God and to know Christ and to be grace in this world, to be glory in this world. But to know that that means we are connected if you keep reading John 17, you'll see just a little few more words that God
gives us this same connection that Christ has to God. It's in part of this prayer. Jesus says, let them have the connection that I have to you. That's amazing. Do you know you have it? Because my prayer is for you to spend every ounce of energy and strength and, and brain you have to find it. Because this world needs it badly. So let's be that church. I invite you to ask for God to help you. Pray as we stand to sing, Jesus shall reign. So when you go into the world, I hope you hear and remember this, um, this, this kind of invitation from God to be the glory and the light in this world. And remember also that God is with us, intimately with us in everything we'll do and every place we go. So rejoice in this and go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.